Let's see now the aspiration flow. During a vitrectomy, it is necessary not only to remove the central vitreous, but also the posterior haloid, the anterior haloid, and the peripheral vitreous, all of which necessitate different aspiration flows. Here is an example. In this case, the retina is far away from the center of the eye. Therefore, the central vitrectomy will not pose great risk. One would want to be quick and efficient, and then would desire to use an elevated flow around the order of 15 to 20 cc's per minute. Then, since we want to remove the anterior haloid without risking the aspiration of the posterior capsule, we drop the cutting frequency and the aspiration flow to 8 cc's per minute. Here the haloid is aspirated. Going back in the central vitreous, one will want to raise the flow level to 15 cc's per minute before starting the peripheral vitrectomy. This is a phacic eye, so a manual indentation is called for. With a vitreous of average periphery, I usually work between 6 and 8 cc's per minute. And then, when I want to remove the last peripheral remainders, I lower the level to between 2 and 4 cc's per minute. One realizes that it is necessary to have the aspiration flow varied according to the particular conditions. But as we have already seen, the aspiration flow will depend upon a number of parameters that must then be precisely controlled during the procedure if we hope to achieve a successful vitrectomy. This is what we are going to see here step by step. First of all, we have the gradient of pressure. The pump generates the gradient of pressure. If the pump is not turning, the same pressure is throughout. And since there is no gradient of pressure, there is also no aspiration flow. The pump functions by creating a depression lower than the intraocular pressure. Thus, the pump is able to create a gradient of pressure as well as the aspiration flow. When using a pressiometric pump, like the Venturi pump, the operator selects the desired depression with the foot pedal. The gradient of pressure obtained by the difference between the depression at the pump level and the intraocular pressure will create a certain aspirating flow. With a debimetric pump, like the peristaltic one, the operator controls the speed of the rollers. At each turn, the roller expels a certain quantity of fluid from the tubing. When returning to its rest position, the tubing creates a depression that will aspirate the column of fluid by the same amount as that which was expelled. For the same flow, this depression that was realized by the rotation of the rollers will be the same as that generated by the Venturi pump. In fact, for a liquid of a given viscosity within a given type of tubing, for a given gradient of pressure, we will always have the same flow, no matter which pump is used. It is true that some manufacturers sing the praises of their pump system obtaining the best flow, as if the universal laws of physics did not apply to ophthalmology. But this is quite untrue. For a given liquid in a given tubing, a certain gradient of pressure always induces the same flow. The experimentation confirmed this law of physics. Using a Venturi pump in BSS, a certain depression at the pump level induced a certain amount of flow. Then, using a peristaltic pump in BSS, a certain flow brought about a certain depression at the pump level. Confirming the law of physics, these two curves are perfectly superimposable. The problem is that during a vitrectomy one is not working with a liquid of a given viscosity. This is easily visualized by thinking of honey and water. 
For a given gradient of pressure, the flow will not be the same in water and in honey. And it is here that we return to the question of which type of pump to use. A pump with vacuum control, like the Venturi pump, only allows the operator to control the depression, and therefore the gradient of pressure. One is unable to control the variations caused by the fluid's viscosity. For the same gradient of pressure, then, different flow amounts will result according to the viscosity of the fluid at any given moment. With a debimetric pump, as with the peristaltic one, the column of aspirated fluid, which fills the space that was created by the rollers, is going to be the same no matter what the viscosity of the fluid is. The flow caused by the rotation of the rollers will thus be constant, but it will bring about varying depressions at the pump level according to the aspirated fluid's viscosity. Bidet and Collin have confirmed these theories. With a venturi pump at 1 Hz, or 60 cuts a minute, one has 15 times the amount of flow in BSS than in egg white for a depression of minus 50 millimeters of mercury, 7 times for minus 150, and 6 times for minus 300. These enormous differences are equally found at 5 Hz, 300 cuts a minute, 10 Hz, 600 cuts a minute, and 20 Hz, 1,200 cuts per minute. With a peristaltic pump operating at 60 cuts per minute, the flow in BSS and the egg white are practically the same, within 10% until 15 cc per minute. For higher flows, the required depressions in the egg white exceed the capacity of the machine. The same findings occur at 300, 600, or 1,200 cuts per minute. The surgical consequences are enormous. The friction forces exist not only in the handpiece, but throughout the length of tubing. The operator never knows how much of the vitreous is present, since he or she will be looking in the ocular of the microscope, and since BSS is the same color as the vitreous. It thus proves impossible to adopt a foot position according to any particular moment. The operator must be able to rely on the pedal to control the aspiration flow. With a venturi pump, one can't rely on its flow control, since one is constantly working between the two extremes, BSS and the vitreous, which are very far from each other. This unreliability is also observed at all cutting frequencies. In contrast, with a peristaltic pump, up to the point where the machine will not be able to provide the required depression, the operator can almost perfectly control the flow, whatever the cutting frequency is. Let's now consider the practical consequences in the context of a central vitrectomy. If a venturi pump is used, and if the operator chooses a maximum depression of minus 50 millimeters of mercury, the aspiration flow will decrease from 13 cc per minute to 0.85 cc per minute. It would be necessary to spend about half an hour performing the procedure. If the operator is impatient, like me, however, he or she may use a higher maximum amount of depression, only stepping lightly on the foot pedal at the start and using more force when the flow is too little. Here we have a decreasing flow, so the operator puts his foot down. The problem then is when returning to BSS, the magnitude of the depression will generate an aspiration flow twice as great as the infusion flow. This is easy to understand when drinking lemonade with honey. In lemonade, the depression created by your mouth gives off a satisfying flow. If you descend into the honey, you would have to create a higher depression in order to get a very small flow. With this large depression, if you return to the lemonade, you would suffocate 
due to the flow being so great. Here is a simulated operation. At first, there are few friction forces and thus a good flow. But later, while the vitreous is coming through the tubing, the operator puts more pressure on the foot pedal. When water will flow back in the tubing, a catastrophe will occur. With the peristaltic pump, the operator selects not the maximum depression, but the maximum flow. Here it is around 12 cc per minute. He or she will use depressions around minus 500 millimeters of mercury, which would be incredibly dangerous with a venturi pump. These depressions will show up on the machine's screen, but the operator doesn't have to consider them, for he or she controls the flow with the foot pedal. In this way, the operator performs a more precise, but also a quicker central vitrectomy, using very high depression levels without risk for the patient. This French culinary expert will easily prove this to you. Here we have some vitrectomy aspirating tubing. It is going to be cut and placed in a glass of rosé wine of very weak viscosity. In order to simulate the action of a peristaltic pump, he will use his wife's preferred instrument when he comes back late at night, the rolling pin. For a certain number of turns of the rolling pin, he is going to pump a certain amount of wine. If he replaces this light wine with a heavier liquid, like maple syrup, and tries again, for the same number of turns of the rolling pin, he will actually pump the same quantity of maple syrup as the wine. Unbelievable but true. For the peripheral vitrectomy, it is not so much a question of going quickly, but of being precise. Using a venturi pump in an infusion at 70 centimeters, one is not able to aspirate in BSS at less than 8 cc per minute. Yet, at the end of the central vitrectomy, the tubing is often filled with BSS. That was the case here, where I had a first alert that made me lift my foot from the pedal. But in spite of that warning, cutting at 700 cuts per minute, in less than a third of a second, the minimum flow with this venturi pump created a disastrous problem. Seeing this again in slow motion shows us that a flow of 8 cc per minute is sufficient to cause a tear within the space of 3 cuts. With a peristaltic pump, it is possible to aspirate at least 8 cc per minute in water by lifting up from the pedal. One can then perform this peripheral vitrectomy with more precision. Six or eight cc per minute is correct most of the time for a flattened retina. In contrast, when the ciliary retina is detached, these levels may already be too much. Here is an example where I created a iatrogenic tear working at 8 cc per minute and only realized what I had done at the second passage. In these cases, it seems better to change the program, as we do while putting a car in first gear, opting for a low aspirating flow program, 
with a maximum aspiration flow of 6 cc per minute. The operator will then have the entire pedal range to go from 0 to 6 cc per minute in trying to execute a precise and complete peripheral retractomy. In this case, things are easy, so we work at 6 cc per minute. But here, in this perilous example, one is forced to drop down to 2 cc per minute. This is of course not possible with a Venturi pump, except to place the bottle 10 cm above the eye, work at minus 10 mm of mercury, and thus spend close to 2.5 hours performing the procedure. In considering all the above, the choice between the Venturi or peristaltic pump immediately becomes a question of security and quickness, for which the peristaltic pump is the answer. Now we arrive at the consequences of the aspiration system's internal diameter on flow control. According to the laws of physics, the greater the diameter, the higher aspiration flow. This will influence our handpiece choice. Bidet and Colin measured the flow in egg white and found that when the internal diameter of the handpiece went from 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters, the maximum flow increased 50%. In surgical terms, the greater the diameter is, the higher the maximum flow with precise control will be and thus a quicker central retractomy results. On my current retractomy machine, the maximum flow is 20 cc per minute. The possibility of decreasing the opening of the port makes it possible to also decrease the maximum flow. The experimentation showed that a reduction of 70% of the port equally decreased the maximum flow. On a practical note, this reduction does not prove to be awkward, for one will close the port opening only for a peripheral retractomy when a high maximum flow level is not needed. This reduction of the port allows, at the low flow level, to increase the selectivity, precision, and security in the removal of those last peripheral featureous fibers. The action of the compliant forces under depression is less noticeable in vitrectomy than in FACO. The FACO phenomenon is well known. In occlusion, while the pump continues to run results in the collapse of the tubing walls and an increase of micro air bubbles. When this occlusion rupture occurs, returning back to the initial level is going to create an additional flow. Thus the following are needed airtight handpieces, depression panels without air bubbles, and tubing as rigid.